Hi, this is Mama Llama Razzle Dazzle here. And today I'm going to show you um, some materials that I'm going to use to make a quilt for some very good friends of mine who are getting married. And what I'm going to do is make something called the Disappearing Nine Patch. I'll show you that as we go. Um, but what we're going to do is make a big nine patch patches, which will be nine different materials in the patch. And then we'll cut it and rearrange it and I'll show you those, how we do that. But first we have to take care of the fabric. So since these are people that are real good friends of mine, I tried to think of what um, they liked or what they reminded me of or things I know of along the way that I learned about them. Um, and then I looked for novelty fabrics um, for that. So my first one is uh, a fabric that's like musical. Um, they both like music. They play a lot of records and um, one of them even like worked in a record store so she's really into music. And so this these fabrics by the way I got at fabric.com and I'll give you a link below for that. Um, Alright so I got a yard of everything and we're gonna wash these fabrics before we start to sew them. Okay so we want to get all the um, sizing and formaldehyde and other chemicals off of the fabrics before we uh, start touching them and handling a lot and that will also pre-shrink the fabrics and get the dyes out so they don't run when they're in the quilt so I'm gonna wash these all together and when I wash them I open them up I never just throw it in like that now when you have this fold here where it's a soft fold from the way they put it on the bolt you want to make sure that you open the fabric up and that that soft fold is open. See here, this crease, if we wash it with that folded like that, that crease will get harder and it will actually make a mark um, and wear the fabric down in, in the washing. So we want to make sure that soft fold is opened up completely and then tossed in the washer. The second fabric I got here is they're real beautiful little hearts now they're getting married so we've got to assume love's involved here right <laughs> and this is really pretty um it will have a lot of the colors that are in the other fabrics too but it's um you know it doesn't have to be all masculine or all feminine right so this one i also bought at um fabric.com and it was a benertex uh, brand of fabric and that's a good one a good brand too. It always comes out nice and wears well and it doesn't fade too fast. So we want them to be able to use this quilt for years and years. So this is number two. Now they like animals and especially cats and dogs so I found this one also on fabric.com that's cat selfies but they have hats so it's cat selfies at the beach. <laughs> so they'll be liking that. Well, and this one also gives a light compared to some of the dark. We wanted to alternate the colors a little bit. We don't want it all dark or all light. And this one is dogs at the beach. <laughs> also dog selfies. So this will be a cute one in there. Now one of the one of the two in the of my friends likes Star Wars a lot. So I happened to find some Star Wars. Now this piece is flannel. Um, and I don't usually mix flannels and um, regular smooth cottons together. But I have been doing it lately because it kind of is neat. It gives you different textures and uh, it doesn't seem to matter. As long as we pre-shrink everything first, everything should come out fine when the, wa uh, when the quilt gets washed. So... Uh, you know because flannels are known for shrinking and shrinking so like if I do everything in hot water then um, everything should you know be pre-shrunk and do well in the quilt another thing they like to do is archery uh, and they sometimes um, make their own bows or, bo or they make their own arrows for their archery so this piece of fabric has arrows all over it with lots of different kinds of feathers and I've watched them uh, put the feathers on the arrows it's quite amazing 
And so I thought they would probably like this piece of fabric in there. And they also like records a lot. So I found, <laughs> same place, uh, fabric.com, these records on the fabric. This will also give me another light um, piece amongst the dark. And one, along with their music theme, one of them plays the guitar out on the porch. I've seen him do it a lot. And so I thought you might like to have some guitars. And then all the musical instruments sort of go along with the music theme, with the records. Okay. And this is an interesting piece. The gentleman um, likes to collect razors, especially old razors, old shaving things. So this was an interesting find at fabric.com and um, what I'll do is um, I think I'll be either making an 8 or a 10 inch block um, and then I'll take uh, a piece here and make it square, it won't have the frame around it or I may have to add strips to get it to be the size of the other patches but um, I'll work that in there somehow because <laughs> I thought, that, you know they really like these. They have a nice collection of old shaving equipment. And last but not least is some sunflowers. Now I um, grow sunflowers in my front yard and they usually get really big and kind of unwieldy but uh, they always like my sunflowers and so every now and then I would sneak a sunflower in their yard. Like I'd drop a couple seeds just by the corner of their fence. <laughs> And then they would get sunflowers. I also did that with, uh, well, morning glories we had in my house. And they migrated down just naturally into their yard. But um, anyway, sunflowers was always the kind of thing that we watched on each other to see who grew the highest one. So I'm sticking some sunflowers in there to have a little fun with the quilt. So I'm off to wash them now. I'm going to open them all up, put them in the washer. And then um, I'm going to wash them all together. And hopefully we'll get out all the, the dyes and chemicals and formaldehyde. And um, I will, you know, I'll show you how we're going to cut them when they're all ready to go. Sometimes I iron them right away and sometimes I don't. We'll see how they come out. Okay, so we'll uh, go get that done and I'll come back to see when I am ready to start cutting it out. Okay, now um, what we're going to do first is we're going to make a nine patch. Um, one of the fun things about working in a small place is there's not enough room to show you this whole thing <laughs> completely laid out. So I'm just going to give you a little tour here. Um, we have nine different materials, but each, each pile that I have actually has more than one type of material in it because I didn't have enough and that's the beauty of making a scrappy quilt. So we're going to have um, one black in the middle and all of the patches that are in the cross um, pieces are going to be cut. So that's how we make the disappearing nine patch. So you want the pieces in the cross hairs here um, to be things that are small prints that won't get distorted by being cut and then the bigger pieces that you want you don't want to cut should be in the corners like for instance I have a couple of these um, I don't want to cut that so I'm going to leave that big in the corner then um, some other ones because I don't have enough of those um, I'm going to use this other cool cat print um, and that would be kind of, it would be okay to cut it up, but it's kind of cute the way it is, showing it big. Okay, so what I did is I measured how big of a quilt I want, and I kind of like the 90 by 108 size for a bed. It's really a queen size, but it's a good um, double size bed that drapes over the edges. And then you also have like enough room if some people, <laughs> or two people are in the bed, and you know it takes up some of the surface area of the quilt so I'm trying I'm heading for that size so I decided I needed 20 um, squares um, 
and then nine sets of those. So um, we're going to make, I think it's going to be four by five, nine patches for four sets of nine, four times across and five times down. So what I'm going to do first is make the nine patches. So I'll sew these two together and then um, these two together and these two together. You can't really see this one too well. This is more of dogs instead of cats and these are arrows. So since they're uh, not really light or dark, because this is kind of a medium, I just put them together. And it'll all work out because we're going to, as we chop up this big nine patch, we're going to end up with all kinds of little pieces and it'll, it'll look great. Okay, so what I'm going to do first is sew these two together, these two together, and these two together. And then I'll come back. I'll leave them connected. I'll show you as I sew. And then we're going to add this one to this, this to this, this to this. And all of them will be hanging together literally by a thread. And that will help us keep them in order. And at that point, we're going to sew them all on all the sides into the full nine patch. And I'm going to sew 20 squares like that. So I'm just going to show you the first one that I do. And then I'll finish up the rest. I'll take you over to the ironing board. We'll iron them, and then we'll start cutting them apart. And then you'll see the magic happen. Okay. So, let's see. First we're going to... This is a corner piece, and this is a, okay, and I'm just going to take three sets over with me here to the machine. And then we'll add that other one when we get these two together. just so you can see better what I'm doing on the machine. I'm going to move these over, but not completely. I'll remember what's what. Okay. And like I said, that's the joy of forking in a small space, but you can do it. You just can't spread out. And I usually just um, overlap them a little bit so I don't get lost. Sometimes I write it down. But anyway... Okay, so I'm going to sew my first two pieces together and try really hard to keep quarter inch seam allowances on your machine. I have a foot that's actually um, a quarter inch and so I just run the edge of that with the edge of the material because at this point if you sew too many seams that are not exactly or close to exactly the right size then things aren't going to fit together. It's going to get all stretched out and weird looking. Okay, so let's just give this a whirl and put the first two together. Okay, now I'm not going to cut this. I'm going to leave that little string in there. And then next I will sew these two together. And it'll be like chain piecing. The important thing is to put this black piece on top right now because that's the one I want to end up in the middle. Okay, so we're going to sew those together. The sunflower is going to be the middle piece, so I'll put that on top of the dogs. All right. I'm going to cut the thread. And you're going to see that I have three pieces all strung together by the thread. Alright, 
Now, I'm going to open this one up. And we'll take the first one from this pile and put it on there. Take the first one from the second pile and we'll put it on the black. And then we'll take the one of the ones that has the razor theme and we'll put that here. So now we're going to sew these three together all at once. And we're not going to cut the thread. And hopefully, <laughs> hopefully the bobbin doesn't run out. Okay, if I can go ahead and check that. It's good. It's full enough. If, if it happens to run out, you just kind of go back to the one that didn't connect it. It'll just help you make sense of it all. Okay. Okay, so I don't cut that one. And I bring up the black and the green that's going to go on the edge. I have to apologize, my voice is getting weird because um, allergies are bad and I had to take prednisone today. So that changes everything. So my voice is a little weird. Okay, so this is the second row. And then the third row, the sunflowers are in the middle. Now I can take this and I can make it like go sideways, upside down, right side up. It doesn't matter because once uh, we start turning the patches for the disappearing nine patch, it's not going to end up all in one direction anyway. So that'll actually be good for how the quilt's going to come out. So you can you won't have a top or a bottom to the quilt, and you'll be able to get even wear by having it just all over. So now we have like the whole nine patch and it's all strung together. It's being held together by these threads in between, but I can't get lost now. I know uh, just exactly where my blocks need to go. So now we're going to sew the sides together. And we want to find the seams of the top and bottom rows stick your fingernail in there so that you can feel the ridge where the um, seams go. Push one seam to the right and one seam to the left. It doesn't matter if it's the top or the bottom. And put a clip on there. So that will be exactly um, having the points match up. All four pieces will match up. So you get your thumbnail in there, you wiggle it around, you make sure you feel that it's, you know, in there. Push one seam to the right and one to the left and put your clip in. Okay, now we need to do it with this one. So the first two blocks and the middle block. Same thing. You can just feel your thumbnail get into the ridge of the, of the uh, four pieces. Put a clip in. After you push the seams to the right and to the left. I don't iron any of this ahead of time because if I need to adjust something then I end up having a crease in there and it will never come out. So you put your thumbnail into the seams, line them up, push one to the right, one to the left, and put the clip on. Okay, now I'm going to sew those two seams. It doesn't matter which row you do first. You just want to make sure your edges are all matched up. It'll come out nicer. I'm not a quilt police person, but there's some things that have to be pretty precise if you want them to come out straight and square. 
Okay, we're gonna stop and get that clip out of there. Sometimes you can use pins instead of clips, um, and sometimes people like to run over the pin to make sure that that is not going to move. Just get very close to it and take your pin out because if you hit the pin you can throw your whole machine out of whack and then you can take it to the shop and you won't be sewing the rest of the day. <laughs> so just get the pins out, try to get as close as you can. Before I go on to the next row, I always look at the other side to make sure I got it. You know, I want to make sure I hit all of the uh, fabric. I don't want to have anything that might have slid on me or something. But I always look because the worst thing in the world is when you're down at the quilting machine and you find a seam that's opened up because you missed it. It's better to just take one extra second and make sure you got both sides. Okay, now we're going to do the other row, the bottom and the middle. It's real important to make sure that the pieces, even though this is not the side you're sewing right now, you make sure they line up too because that's what keeps the quilt square. take a look underneath here underneath your quilt patch because you can uh, kind of pull the one piece down to make it straight and match up and it also keeps you from running over something that might be folded under if that happens you're gonna have to rip it out that's not one of my favorite words nine patch sewn together. You can see all of it. Um, let's see here. Over here we have um, hard to show you. <laughs> So here we have these pieces intersecting and they're all matched up. And the same thing with the hearts and guitars and records and Star Wars. All those the points are matched up really nice. Okay. Now what I'm gonna do, uh, I will sew these other 19 patches together and then we'll iron them t together um, and then I'll show you how to cut them and re-match them up okay so the first thing is to make all of your nine patches if you're making a baby quilt you don't want to use a, a piece that's a nine inch square you just adjust the size of the square by the kind of material you have how much of it you have and also if it has a pattern in it or not that you need to keep like big and not cut um, and it's a really flexible pattern and it's pretty quick as far as quilts go and it's great for gifts because um, it's it's a lot of scrappy patchwork look and people like those very much plus they'll use it I've noticed if I make quilts that are kind of fancy and have uh, special stars in them and stuff nobody will use the quilt because they want to keep it and 
I want my quilts to keep people warm. So I think the scrappy look is good for everybody. I tried to make the scrappy materials that I use something that they like. Like in this case, um, Vince likes Star Wars and he collects razors and and Heather, she loves music and collects records and they both love flowers and gardening. So I think we're we got a pretty good mix for them here. Okay. So I'll come back when we've got this whole pile made. Okay. Now we're going to take the nine patches that we made, and in my case, we have 20 of these, 29 patches, because it's going to be four nine patches across and five down to fit a double bed. So I started with nine inch squares, sewed them into this nine patch, and what we're going to do now is fold. Um, the nine patch in half and cut it down the middle and then we're going to fold those pieces in half. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to fold this nine patch in half. Okay, and we're going to cut it down the middle. We're going to make sure these edges are lined up good and then when we get those cut down, uh, we're going to fold that in half and cut this down the middle and we're going to end up with four pieces. I'll show you that in a minute, but once they're sewn together, you have this. And so this is the disappearing nine patch because now you can't really tell uh, where the nine patch was. <laughs> it ends up being a 16 patch because there's four pieces of fabric in each one and you did it with just four really uh, three seams when you cut the nine patch in half. So we want to do this to all four, I mean all 20 of the patches. So I'm going to show you, I don't usually iron at this point because if I need to, you know, just have a little bit of give from the materials, uh, I don't want to have a permanent seam. Okay, so I'm going to make sure these edges match. And I'm going to cut down the middle. But I want to like pull it a little bit, but hold on to those edges because we don't want to lose the straight block. At the end of this of the sewing of this, if it's not quite square, we're going to square it up and I'll show you how to do that. Okay, so I'm going to fold those in half. Up those edges. Let's make sure I got two pieces. Okay, now when you open these up, you'll see where your nine patch was, but um, what you can do then is turn these any way you want. Okay, this one was here. All right. And so what I'm going to do is turn it either once or twice. Once or twice. Or three times. In this case, I have to match up a seam. Okay, so you need to use your skills where you use your thumbnail and you get the joint of that seam just exactly right because you still want it to look like all the pieces belong there. <laughs> so I would like to take it and put it where I don't need to match up the seam. It doesn't matter. Nobody will even know. Now if you have all the fabrics matching um, you should probably turn them all the same way. I have a lot of different materials in here so I'm going to probably do it like this. So I have two in here, and then those two black ones will match up somewhere else. Okay, so I'm going to fold these over and sew those two together. Now 
allergies are bad again today and the wind is blowing like crazy. Sorry for the sniffing. <laughs> okay, so we're going to make this nice straight seam. Keep all the seams the same width apart, quarter inch or whatever you're using, half inch. It's all up to you, but just make sure you're consistent. Okay, we're just going to sew these two pieces together. So these two pieces together and put our block back together. Now if you have anything you got to match up, you've got to pin at least the seam where they come together. So. Get your thumbnail and your fingernail in there, wiggle it, and push one seam one way and one the other. Put your clip or your pin on, and that will help make your seams uh, all go together and look nice. Because even though it's a scrappy look, you don't want it to look like you just threw it together. <laughs> and do the same for this one, since this this part of the block has I'm gonna put that up there a little bit. Um, this part of the block has one that needs to match. Okay. Oh, here's another one. Okay, we're going to sew this all together. up. We now have the disappearing eye patch. Isn't that neat? It looks like you pieced that thing for days and all it is is a nine patch cut in half and in half again and then re-put back together. And so you didn't have to deal with small pieces. If you're making this with like a six inch block instead of a nine inch block this little piece here will end up being like this instead of this nice big one <laughs> so that would be really tedious to pin all that together okay so what I'm gonna do now is do all 20 blocks like this I'm gonna listen to my book got my audio book while I'm sewing that way I get uh, some entertainment and education <laughs> while I'm sewing and um, I'll be back with you when we're going to sew the 20 blocks together into the quilt top. Alrighty, now what we're going to do is sew our 20 patches together. So we're going to do a row of five coming down and then we will match up 
one putting the right sides together we're going to put this together just like we did the nine patch so what we're doing is making a 20 patch basically okay so we're going to um, sew the first two that would go across together okay so we're going to match up the seams put our clips in and then we will follow up with the second one down and the second one um, turned over to the right on the right side so we're going to be sewing um, a row of five with the right sides together for the second row then when we're done with that we're going to open this one up and sew the next piece on all the way down so I'm just going to show you how I do that first I'm going to pin everything because where the seams match up I want them to match now I told you I would show you how to square up um, your blocks if they got wonky on you when we did this cutting process and in that case what you do is I don't have any that came out that way <laughs> Um, but you would like hold your really long ruler here and with chalk mark them and then just trim it a little bit if it's a quarter of an inch or however much it's hanging over because you want the block to be square um, so you just have to make sure your edges are straight sometimes it's only off a tiny bit and you can get away with sort of um, pulling it one way or another and it'll work out alright so I'm sorry I didn't have any that came out wrong to show you. <laughs> that was luck. Because <laughs> usually when you cut them, it, something goes wrong. But this time, everything worked out right for me. Okay, so I'm going to sew these first two blocks together. I've got the right sides together. Here's the block underneath. That'll be row one. And this block on top is going to be row two. Okay, so we're just going to sew them same seam allowance as we've done for the whole thing. If you used a half inch, use a half inch. I use a quarter. Some use three eighths, five eighths, whatever you use, just make sure it's the same. Every now and then, just make sure that. The stitching is here, you know, and that yeah, you got both pieces together. going to cut this string here, the thread. I'm going to add the second block. So here's the first row. I am going to take a peek under here to make sure I'm not getting the same kinds of fabrics together. Okay, so I just, yeah, sometimes it's going to happen because you just can't help it. But, um, same with this um, block in the second row. I just want to make sure they're all different all the way down, and they are. And like I said, there's going to be a time when something's going to not match, or it'll be the same, but we're trying really hard not to get anything to touch each other. Okay. And sometimes actually when it does touch each other it's okay because one will go one way and one will go at, at a different angle and it'll look okay. So we're going to sew the second row. So you know this is just a little bit over so I'm just going to eyeball it rather than trim it. It'll be okay. Now we just want to check it and make sure 
especially where that one was hanging over a little bit here um, that it, it was a straight seam on the other side so it made it it caught both pieces that's the main thing straights straight is what we really want but do your best Cutting the thread, and we're going on for the third row. And take a peek here, make sure the second row doesn't have the exact same pieces. Okay, so we've got over here some dogs and cats but they're only going to be together for a short while so that'll be all right and check this side this is the top part so it looks like we're going to have the blacks matching up and those are only small so that'll be okay This is row three. Cutting that one because we're just running a continuous string to hold them all together. Let's check out the bottom one here. Those don't have any conflicts, that's good. Stars are together. So we put Star Wars in there. Oops, we got dogs and cats, but it's a whole big block, so I don't want to do that. Let's turn it again. Let's see what we get. That's much better. It wouldn't matter if it was dogs and cats, it's just the, that they're the same kind of print, same background, so we're trying to avoid that. Just for the sake of the long arm and for keeping the batting in the quilt when it gets washed we want to make sure we cross those seams so one goes one way and one goes the other. Alright, 
that's row four. Now we're doing the last row, row five. Right. Checking those, no conflicts. no conflicts so we'll just pin that there used to be a time when they would tell the quilters to press their seams open like they would when they're making clothing um, and they found out that when you open the seams it left the stitching line unguarded and when you wash the quilt over and over, the batting would come out a little bit at a time, and that was called bearding. So when you cross the seams over each other, it locks them at the space in, and then you don't get bearding with your quilting, with your batting. Okay, so that's just a little tip. No pressing the seams open anymore. And now we're going to sew the fifth row. I just want to mention one thing. Before I started sewing these long um, blocks together, I made sure I filled a bobbin because there's nothing worse than getting all the way done and you find out you ran out of bobbin thread. So just make sure you start out with a new bobbin and then go ahead on as you're pulling these back in your lap, um, check underneath and make sure all the s fabrics are caught together. You don't want to have a hole when you get down to the long arm machine and find out you didn't catch all the pieces. Okay, so that looks good. And now I'm going to open this up. So we have block number one and block number two. And they are connected right here. And this is how we're going to be able to keep the order right and open up the blocks in the right order to add the next block. Okay, so we have row one and two done. We only have to do four rows, so this ought to go pretty quick. Alrighty, so now we're going to add block three to make row two. I mean, sorry, block three to make row three. It's the first row first block of row three. I'll get it yet. <laughs> right, now this one has a couple that need to get matched up because I turned it a different way and that's all right. When you're using only nine different fabrics and all the blocks are exactly alike, you have to be a little more careful when you turn your blocks because you'll be able to tell and then you need to make a, more of a pattern. But with this uh, way, because I had many more than nine fabrics, um, we can have a little bit more of a scrappy look. So I'm going to sew the first row, block three. Somehow the thread jumped out of the needle, so let's thread it. This model machine has a very nice needle thread. <laughs> I like it very much. Okay. So I gotta hang on to that thread so it doesn't go under. Just for a few stitches.
first row. Then we're going to pull up and we see this is where it connects. Let's see if I can show you that better. The string is here between the first and second rows. So I'm going to open up the second block of the second row. <laughs> then I'm going to put row three on. see that this one came out a little bit so I'm just going to stay consistent all the way down as I sew that and then the size will be right. Okay, there we go. but I'm just going to keep my seam allowance on the top. Alrighty. Let's see. Here's row three. This is the second block. If you think about it, try to pull these little strings out that get in there because when you're standing at the long arm or the ironing board, it just is more wear and tear on your back, so you might as well do it while you're sitting down here. all be different so let me pin them real quick This is the third block of row three. And what's really good is, since I have about a 50-50 mix of different kinds of blocks, it uh, 
looks pretty cool because uh, I don't want into too many that are going to overlap or be next to each other that are the same. So that's good. Wouldn't be a crisis if it did, okay, but uh, I kind of like it to look mixed up. Alright, this is row four, black three. Kind of get under there and pull that bottom one back a little bit. Oh, a little stinker. There we go. square them up at the top and the bottom of your block when you sew so that these don't open at an angle. They'll be straight if you keep both sides straight. Alright, we just have last row here to do. And then only one more row to add on, so that'll be wonderful and quick. Alrighty, so I'll pick up another one. Okay, row five, block three. Anyway, I ran out of bobbin thread. Oh. Wah. <laughs> How far back? This is what I hate. My bobbin thread runs out. Okay, oh, we gotta go all the way back there. Darn, darn, darn. A lot of miles on these big blocks when you go the whole length. No problem. We're just gonna fix it. We'll run over it all again. Catch up, I'll go a little bit back.
Alrighty, we're almost back to where we were. <laughs> Last row, yay! We still have the string there to hold them together. on one way back down. <laughs> it's nice to see there's bobbin threaded this time. <laughs> okay, so now we're back to row one. We're going to open up number three. And we only have five more to sew on. Okay, so this is block three of the first row. And this is block four, so after we get this row done, then we'll sew all of the other rows across the other way, and we'll be done, except for ironing and quilting. like this blue on the Star Wars patch because it brings out that blue in there so that's why I won't put them together. Sometimes you can make the colors make sense. And the little black square that I have in there here and there is actually a good place for the eye to rest because this is kind of a busy quilt. So the, the idea behind a solid in there and there's a little bit of white solid too. Um, that helps give the eye a place to go when it gets a little chaos, chaotic. So that's just a little art concept. You need a little place for the eye to rest. Here goes block number four of row two.
three. Those are cute cats on there, aren't they? <laughs> Alrighty, let's see. Too many that are um, doubling up on each other. That's interesting and good. I knew some of the blacks would because they're kind of all over and they're in every block. Okay. heavy here. So that helps us. Um, here's the string. And that helps us uh, keep these all together and not wonder what row belongs with what. when there's enough uh, patches that you don't always have to line up all the squares. That's kind of easy. <laughs> one we run into a couple where they'll be together. No, I turned it. We're good. be a little higher but we'll trim that
check the back sides of all these. The Looks like my bobbin thread got loose in a couple of places, so this is why we checked it. And I'm just going to go over this one spot again. Just for a little while. It's good it shows up like this. I just want to show you this got loopy for some reason. And then straightened out further down. So I'm just going to go over that section again because if you see... If I pull them apart a little bit, the, sti the stitches um, are loose. And we want this quilt to last a hundred years, so we're just going to go over it again. Sometimes things get hung up or the... I don't know. Maybe we need a new needle too, so we'll check it out. So you can see where the tension got loose for some reason and where our new line of stitching is. I put it on the inside of that so it'll be stronger and it actually worked better. And we've got a good bobbin thread in there. So I'm just going to... See where we have to go to. I'm just going to go down two blocks just to be sure. I, I really want this to be, to be good. It'll last a long time. If I wasn't able to see nice straight stitching there, I would. Um, have unthreaded the machine and rethreaded it. And also taken out the bobbin and put that back in. And it probably would have straightened up okay. I just didn't catch it in time. I'm kind of glad things like that happen so you can see. Okay. Perfect. Alrighty, now what we're going to do is uh, where our rows are all hooked together. And that's row one, right? And here's row two, and they're connected. See? Right here. So I'm going to take them and fold them over, fold row one over on row two. There's other ways to do this. You can lay them out on your bed and sew them together and then take the row back and lay it on the bed and then do the next row and that's all good. But for me, <laughs> this actually saves me time and keeps the strings off my bed. Okay, so now I'm going to match up the seams along this whole row that goes across, and there will be four rows, I mean, four big blocks to sew together. So, we're going to pin everything together that we need to. I almost always pin the first block because I want it to be straight this way and that way, so that it helps keep our quilt square and now if some of the blocks don't seem completely straight in this row 
you can take a deeper seam allowance because from here on out uh, it doesn't really matter as far as things needing to fit together. So I had one there where it was just a little bit hanging over. Don't tell the quilt police. <laughs> I don't let the quilt police in where I sew. I'm not perfect. I try really hard to get that beautiful result. But I'm not going to have a stroke over something that I enjoy. <laughs> and that I'm worried what somebody else will think of it. Because it's my art. And it's the best I can do at the moment. Sometimes when you uh, have an allergy trouble and you're on a lot of medicine, it sort of keeps you from being perfect at everything you do. It's the best way I can explain it. And so, if things aren't a hundred percent right on the quilt, you know, it's not that I don't care. I do care, but um, sometimes you just can't do it. <laughs> but the person who gets the quilt will know how much I love them and that I thought about them every moment and every stitch. And to me, the love in the quilt's what counts. This row requires a little bit more um, clipping because it's got more seams going this direction. Almost done though. Right. Now, sometimes in this case, where that little string that's holding everything together might not give you enough space to clip it. And at this point, you can clip that thread so that you can get a better seam. Because it was only meant to hold it in place till you get to this point. It doesn't really help the quilt after that. You don't need it after you've matched everything up. And I usually like to pin the last one. Same reason, so I get that squared up. Alrighty, now we're going to sew the first row to the second row. We'll hope our bobbin thread doesn't run out. <laughs> Alrighty. Now, I'm just going to pull the needle and the bobbin thread out and straight so when I do this first part they don't um, get jammed underneath. I like to hang on to both of them. As soon as I make a couple stitches, I let go. And it gives you a nice clean start. Nothing buckles under. good idea. <laughs> it's gonna break a needle for sure. places I was talking about where 
first of all, I'm going to clip this string that held things together. And this is just off a little because it's one of the spots that was cut uh, when we made the... And I should have just trimmed that. So I'm just going to follow the line of the top block. the seams on the back. Make sure they all collected uh, both sides, stitched in everything with a good seam allowance so nothing will come apart. And while I've got this long string here, I'm going to what? Trim it. Because we don't want to do it while we're <laughs> while our back is over the long arm machine. Okay, now I'm going to open this up and show you. It's I'm working in a small space, so I can't really open it all up and show you how beautiful it looks, but there now you have two rows together, and it looks really nice, uh, really, uh, very cool. All our blocks are going to look like that when we get done, so I'm going to finish the other three rows. I'll leave the camera running and I'll probably speed that part up because you'll get it after a while, but some people like to see how... so you have to just keep um, the weight off of the sewing machine and the needle because you don't want them to break. You don't want the quilt to stretch either. a thing, a little thing. This patch is sewn going this direction, the seam. So I'm not going to go pushing that one that way because it'll twist the material and make a lump. So I'm just going to fold them both this way and I'll take the one underneath and push it in the other direction. going along. 
long, sometimes the material underneath will sneak over this way and you could end up sewing it into your seam and so that won't be good. So every now and then just, you know, push the material this way um, to get it out of there and help take the tension off the needle. check the seams here and make sure that they are all caught. All right, now the things are getting a little heavy so what I'm going to do is go down to the end, row 5. got row five here and I'm going to flip it onto row four and so from the other end it'll be a lot less drag and bulk okay so it'll be like sewing one and two only from the other end okay then we'll we'll do the third row while we've got it the, at this end That's another reason that um, sewing them all together like we did the nine patch and having that little thread in the in between really helps because it keeps it from being a mess. A lot of times when I'm sewing this kind of stuff and you know you, you don't have to think about it too much because it's just like physically matching it up. Um, I'll listen to a book on tape or music but I like books on tape because I can listen to books that I've been wanting to read but can't get time to because <laughs> my hands are busy doing other stuff. Um, plus you learn a lot. And, some of them are entertaining and some of them are facts. Sometimes I'm interested in things but uh, I just don't have time to to read sometimes about things. I'm always reading a lot of technical stuff so it's kind of fun to hear stories uh, and actually some history that I never got to learn or wasn't interested in learning at the time. So I like the audio books. You gotta try to keep your brain engaged, so try to learn three new things every day. That's what I try to do. It keeps my mind and you get and turn it into mush. <laughs> I need that because when you have a latex allergy and you're stuck in the house you don't have a whole lot of human interaction and uh, you start to get a little stir crazy sometimes so you just try to keep your brain always moving on something else and not thinking about yourself too much. Okay, that's why I like making quilts because I think about the person I'm making them for. Alright, we're gonna sew row 5 to row 4.
I was just checking that I got a bobbin thread still. <laughs> we don't need to repeat that little problem. Check our seams again. Just make a habit of doing this because it's much easier to fix it now than when you got it down on the long run. Okay, now we just have one more row to do, so we're gonna take row four and five and flip it over and on to row three, which is getting a little heavy now because we got it to the middle. <laughs> okay. okay. Throw three looking up at us. Here's row four. Going to match it up. It's nicer if you have big room where you can stand up and open it up and look at it and work on it, but this is not the case. We can always wish. <laughs> You'll be alright. So when I get this uh, row sewn, I will go iron the quilt top, and I will not like, like I'll just press it. I'm just gonna press down on the seams, and I'm not gonna wiggle the iron because that will stretch the material out. We don't want that. I want it to stay nice and square, especially till we get to the quilting table. Okay, so I will be ironing it without you seeing it, and then the next time we'll be together on this video, we will be at the long arm machine. And we'll quilt it, bind it, label it, and be. See, it looks like a big project, and it is a big project. This is true. But if we look at it, as that we only have to add one piece of material at a time. That's all we can physically do. And just one piece at a time without looking at the whole big project and make it overwhelming for ourselves, then you can get it done. One piece at a time. Everybody makes them the same way. This is a little bit Just gonna trim off the one corner. Okay. My first quilt that was squares when I was a kid, I just sewed rows of squares together. And I wasn't aware of like that the seam allowances were so important. 
and I could never get the rows to match up. So it was a, a wonky looking quilt. It kept me warm, but it wasn't very nice until I really learned how important it is to try to keep the same seam allowances and when you cut your blocks or rip your blocks that you try to rip them all in the same size because the more blocks you have and the more off they are if they're each off an eighth of an inch and you've got a hundred blocks it's gonna be really far off so just try and every time you make a quilt you get better at it you get more precise and you get the seams better and no time at all you gotta do a couple of them you'll get some really beautiful quilts then so never give up one piece at a time and this is our last row Vibrated off the machine to the floor. Get sloppy. Keep checking that last row. <clears throat> Make sure that the bobbin did the right thing and that every piece is caught. And it looks good. Okay, so we are finished with the top except to iron and quilt it. Let me just see if I can show you a little bit of this beautiful pile. <laughs> really got a nice mix of fabrics and everything is sewn nicely tightly together and we used really good quality stuff so um, it's gonna take a lot of wear and tear and washing and drying over the years and, all right I'm gonna iron it and then we'll go work on the long arm and I'll show you how we can quilt it up Show you one more part of it. Very nice. Okay. 
So we'll meet up in a little while. The long arm quilting machine. This particular model is made especially for me <laughs> um, because it's latex free. They took me on as a challenge when I told them I needed a long arm quilting machine with no rubber at all and they produced it no sweat they were they called me with questions um, normally where they would glue these leaders which are the things you um, pin the um, quilt to they put rivets in instead of rubber cement and none of the handles have any rubber the buttons are hard plastic it's all basically metal except for and plastic except for the the cotton leaders. These are like duck cloth. So um, this is wonderful and um, I haven't had any trouble ever using it. There's two modes to working with this machine. One is to have it continuously sew and the other is to have it only sew when you move it. Um, I used to use the one where you just sew when you move it. It's a little bit louder. Um, but I found that I really liked using it um, with the continuous mode after I got used to it. It just runs constantly and that means you have to move constantly. Um, but it's really great because it feels like you're floating and it's actually faster to quilt that way. Okay, so um, there was a different kind of plate on here. It was just a little square thing. And um, I also found that if I want to use a template or um, a ruler or something, it was hard to get it to sit. So I bought this extra plate. Um, it's called Ruler Mate. And then you can also use your hands a little bit differently with it. Um, this machine has no electronic automatic... Um, uh, stitching it doesn't do any computerized designs you have to do everything yourself and I like it that way because um, then it's just what I made instead of what somebody else made although sometimes I think it would be nice to have those extra kind of things but um, this is was what my budget allowed for and um, for them to make it latex free for me was really a gift and it's given me a lot of, um, I've been able to make a lot of gifts for people. And um, I like that. And I didn't have to send it out to another quilter. Um, if I send it out to another quilter, um, it will probably be contaminated um, by their animals, um, shoes, any kind of rubber balloons, anything that could be in their environment. So I'm really glad that I can do this myself. It's a drain on your back sometimes, but um, it's, uh, you just uh, can do it when you feel like it and you can let it go and uh, work on it other days when you feel better. Okay, so what I'm going to do first is I have the back for the quilt that we're doing for Heather and Vince, and it's a flannel. I washed it and dried it in hot so this will not shrink. And it won't bleed onto anything. So now I'm going to go on to the other side of the machine and pin it all the way down. So I'm just going to go over there. I usually uh, pin the selvage edge if I have one because those are always very nice and very straight. Um, those will get cut off too at the end so I won't have to worry about that pulling in or puckering in on something because you don't want to leave your selvages in anything. Okay, so I'm going to match the selvage edge up with the edge of this leader here. Now some people use zippers. To me, if I use a zipper, I'm going to have to rip the zipper out <laughs> and then I'm going to have to sew the zipper on. And to me, it's just, uh, I don't know, I like doing it this way. I don't want to add another step where I have to when I get done with the quilt and I'm real happy to get it done. <laughs> I don't want to have to sit there and carefully rip out a zipper. It's all whatever is your preference. Okay, so I'm just going to go down this whole way and pin it. 
And once I get down all the way, I'll come back with you and show you how we do the other side. Okay, so I pinned it on this roller. Now this is actually the roller that's going to accept the whole quilt as it gets quilted. But I'm rolling it onto this one first because um, when I get down to the other end, I'll pin it on the, the bar where everything's going to get started from and then I'll roll it back and it helps to take out some of the wrinkles and um, you get a straighter quilt back and you want to take your time with this step keep the edges even like right here and then every now and then I go down to the other end and I push the fabric all the way to the end and try to keep the wrinkles out down here. You have to just be careful when you're, you know, sort of stroking the material to, get, to be even better so you don't get a pin in your hand. It can rake a, get like a, a pin sticking in you. After you get a couple layers of the material on, you're good. You don't have to worry about that. But in the very beginning, you have like two or three layers the pin can stick through. Okay, so I'm just going to keep winding this. And it's really good to have it hang over the other rollers on the other side because it gives it some weight and then it um, goes on better. I'm going to go back down. I just have to coax it a little bit. Okay, now I'm at the point where the selvages reach the other side. So, what I'm going to do that way is um, pin it onto the other leader. And I'll just show you for a minute what we've got on this other end because there are two rollers. Oops. I told you we're working in small spaces. <laughs> And my basement is not very big, and it is definitely a, a challenge down here, but it works. You can make anything work. Okay, so we have two uh, rollers here. This one is going to hold the quilt top, and it can actually be pushed up out of the way. And then this bottom one here is the one that's going to hold the back of the quilt and so we're going to pin this all the way down just like we did the other side doing the selvages right against the edge of the leader that helps us keep it square and in this case um, this is where it's really important you don't want the back getting skewed or you can have um, a crooked quilt so this using your selvage edges or one that you have ripped and that you know is straight is going to help keep your quilt back square. So I'm going to pin this all the way down just like I did the other side and then I'll show you how I roll it back. Okay, now what we have here is all of the backing still on the the roller where it's going to, the whole quilt is going to end up. So we want to roll this back to this side which is where everything is going to start. All the action is going to start down at that end. So I'm just going to release the gear on the one side of the roller and we're going to just turn the side where the side where we want it to end up to start with. So if you hold some tension on the back roller and keep turning the front roller, the tension evens out, the wrinkles seem to disappear, and where there might have been a little sag, um, it straightens out by doing this rolling it twice technique. If you don't do it this way, you may end up with some surprises and bubbles and stuff in your backing. So this keeps the back very straight and square and tight. 
So I just have a little bit more to go. If you see any strings on your back at this point, you want to pick them off because if you use a back that has a little bit of a see-through, um, transparent look to it, they will. Th all those uh, strings are going to show up on the back, and you can't get them out unless you cut the back open, and you're not going to do that because you don't have any way to sew it back together without it fraying. Okay. So now our back is all done, nice and tight. That's uh, how we like it. You might want it a little tighter, but we'll do that at the start of our quilting. Okay, the next thing we need to do is put the quilt top on this roller. Hi, uh, we're going to take the quilt top and put it on to the long arm rollers, the ones in the back here. Um, Right here, I don't know if I can show you. Okay. Um, I'm sorry about the roaring in the background. My furnace has to run and I can't turn it off. <laughs> but um, what I'm going to do now is the backing measured 108 by 108. The quilt measures 97 by 120. So we're going to be cutting some of it, the length off, which is fine. So I just want to put the short length on the backing. So I'm just going to find like where we had four blocks. So one, two, one block, two. So that's the wrong way. <laughs> All right, so we'll put that down this way. And count again. Keep counting the same row over. Yay, that's the way we want it to go. Okay, so we're going to put it in that direction. We're going to push all of it over to the other side so the weight of the quilt top um, will make it easier for us to pin it on. And we're going to put it on the top roller. We'll pin it just like we did the others. And usually when you're making a quilt the, on a long arm because of how it pulls in, you have 10 inches longer and 10 inches wider. Okay, so that you end up with five inches on each side. Okay, so I'm just going to pin this to the leader here. I used to use really long um, skinny pins that had those yellow flowers on. I'm sure if you sew, you've seen them. But it doesn't... The tops of those sometimes came off on me, <laughs> and they bent really easy. So I find if I just use a nice strong straight pin, um, sometimes use the ones with those little buttons on. Uh, any, any of them really work. You don't want the head of the pin to be too big or bulky though, because it'll just kind of be in your way. As I pin this, I'm not pulling it tight, but I'm just making it like straight and I'm keeping my quilt square. Here. I really, I know I'm going to be cutting off 
part of this and two of the blocks that I really like that are with the razors that I like for Vince <laughs> are on this section that's going to end up going. So before I make too much more of a mess, <laughs> I'm just going to reverse this. Well, do it now because when you do it, it's permanent. If you pin it on this side or this side, just be consistent. So today I'm just going to pin it on the back of the leader because sometimes um, if you are straightening and the pins catch you in your hand when you're rubbing it across, it hurts. So try to keep them covered up. I don't want to bleed on the quilt. <laughs> Inevitably though I sometimes do. Try not to.
get to the ends, both ends, you want to pin like three or four times very close to there because that is the part that gets most of the tension. Okay, and we're just going to roll the top on to the roller. Every now and then I will go either up or down. I'm going to collect any strings we find along the way. We don't want them sandwiched in there. There's other strings here and there, just pull them off now because it will be a pain when it's in the middle of your quilting work. And we'll just go back and forth and we try to make sure the edges are even. That's not going anywhere. Push my way up here, and this is a little bit off, so I'm going to try to fix it before. Because we won't be re rolling this like we did the back. Okay, so it's important that this edge stays pretty even on both ends. And that way we know it'll stay square. If you have material that you can actually see your threads through, like say white or a light color, this is the time you want to trim the back as you're rolling it up. Just trim these uh, threads off in the dark it doesn't really matter too much but if it's white you're going to see that through your quilt and you also want to check the quilt back to make sure there's no strings laying on there because um, those will show through this is a flannel and it's thick so we won't have any problem with the grids today okay and we're just gonna fold everything up here this roller and I'm going to raise them up like that so now I have space under here so I can um, put the quilt bag in. So you'll get, if you have a long arm or you're going to get one, you'll find which one uh, quilt beddings you like the best and it uh, has a lot to do with how the needle goes through it. Um, if it skips stitches, anything like that. So I have found all the time now, excuse me, that this mountain mist batting is really pretty good. It's um, soft and light loft batting, so it gives you a nice quilt, um, but it also makes a warm quilt. Uh, and it's polyester. So it doesn't shrink up. If you like the old-fashioned look of quilts with uh, the shrinking into the cotton, um, you can use a cotton batting or a cotton polyester batting will do the same thing. And I've used both. Those both work well. Um, but this is the one I go to all the time because it gives me good results and it doesn't jam up my needle and all that. Try not to handle it too much because I don't want it to pull apart. But this is a really nice quilt batting for long arm. So I'm going to put it uh, lined up along the meter tab up here because we're going to roll the quilt that way. Okay, and then I'm going to pull it down so that the widest part of my quilt top will definitely have batting in it. So I'm just going to spread this out until we get it all lined up. And now I'm going to unfurl a little bit of the quilt top. And then I'm going to gently put the roller back down. Now we want to get the hook 
the edges even with the quilt pattern up here. And if you happen to turn this like I just did, sometimes it pulls a little batty back. So you have to keep just working it so you get it straight. And sometimes my first row, I'll just tuck in the quilt under the roller. Just till we're gonna sew this edge down first and then you'll be able to snug it up. You don't wanna like quilt on it like this, but just to sew it fast to the edge. Some people pin this part, I don't. It just seems to make more trouble for me. Okay, on this side too, we have this clip that we put on it here. And then we have a piece of Velcro on the actual table. Just gonna snug that up there. So now it's hanging on to both edges really well. Now we're going to put in uh, a new bobbin. kind of hard to show this part, so I'm just going to change it. I'll do a whole class on the long arm one day and then you'll get to see all the, the parts. But uh, the bobbin has a little slit in it. And we put the thread in going to your right and then pull it into the slit and then gently down into that part of the bobbin and it should move just a tiny bit um, you don't want it running away though and I'm just going to snap that back in okay now I've got to find some white thread last quilt I did, I used a little variegated for a baby quilt, that came out cute. So I'm just going to use white traditional on this one. holes you can put it through to get it to the front. You can use either one. Alright, come around to the other side. There's three holes in this little section that's next. And you learn on your machine uh, which way makes the best tension for your thread and which is the best thread for your machine. I use the signature quilting thread on a cone and it's uh, got to be quilting not sewing. <laughs> And it'll be nice and strong, give you good results. 
I'm going to hold on to this and go through the tension rings. And then it gets caught on a little hook there. And I use this little thing because it seems to need a little extra tension and that always seems to work well. and then through the needle. And this machine doesn't have a needle threader, but the needle's like a nail. It's really big. <laughs> so most of the time you don't even have to be looking straight at it. You can get it in there. Okay, so now I have a bobbin thread, but I need to bring it up. So I'm going to start here in the corner. I'm going to put the needle down and put the needle up. One press makes it go down, one go, goes up. I'll bring it forward and the bobbin thread. Let's see if I can show you is right here. So now we have the bobbin thread and the top thread. We're going to hang on to those and do another stitch or two. Okay, and now I'm going to turn it on. And we are just going to very carefully keep the edge straight and sew the sandwich together at the top. Okay, now I'm going to put the needle down. I try to always leave the needle down to stop it. Alright, now, here we have uh, on the back, it's good to take a look. Um, but I'm not going to undo it. I'll, I'll show you when I get like a row done here, what that looks like. But I can feel with my hand after experience that it's um, sewing good. The bobbin thread's not too loose, not too tight. Usually the best way to see is only see the top thread stitching. If you see part of the bobbin thread coming up, little extra loops, it's too loose in the bobbin. And you can either change the tension up here or tighten the screw on the bobbin a little bit. Um, I have adjusted the bobbin though, so I know it's good and it's stitching well. So I'm just going to go down to the end of the quilt and I'll be back up. So I made it across, and now I want to tighten up this top piece because I'm going to um, stitch down the sides as far as I can. So I'm doing that at the bottom, and I'll come back up here and do it at the top. bring that bottom thread up to the top is so we don't have to look all over the back for bobbin threads at the end. Always pull them up to the top. Now I'm just going to go straight down this side. <laughs> now I'm going to start to quilt at this point. I've snugged up the top. It's nice and bouncy but not too tight. And I'm just going to do an all over pattern. You can do anything you want. You can make lines around every one, every patch, or since this is really busy and you're not going to notice uh, fancy quilting of any kind, I'm just going to go all over it with hearts and leaves. It's a nice pattern that I've, you know, come to like a lot and it looks pretty. It does the job of holding the quilt sandwich together and um, it looks really nice. So before I go any further, I'm going to clip these four threads that I've had here for a while. Um, that's going to be in the binding that corner there, so it won't be noticeable if you leave them and just tuck them under. But I like to clip the threads wherever I go. 
Okay, so I'm just gonna start uh, quilting. Um, I usually go from one end to the other and then back. So I will go down to the other end, come up here and turn it, roll the new quilt pieces to it, uh, to the other roller, and then we'll quilt some more. Robin has run out. I'm just going to get another one. It's really uh, looking good. It's relaxing. Sometimes it's almost meditative to work on a quilt like this. Um, it does have a tendency to get Tired, uh, tiring on your back, <laughs> but um, you know, there's no rules about this. You can quilt it however you like. You can quilt for 10 minutes and stop. You can turn on the music, get going in a nice rhythm, and uh, that's kind of fun. But if uh, you feel like doing like three hours worth, you can probably finish it. Now I just drew up the bobbin down here, and uh, so now I have like, I'm holding on to three strings here, I'm going to go up and down a couple times to lock in those stitches. I'll start it, and then I'll stop it, and I'll find those strings that I had there. I pulled up and I'm going to cut them right away. Close to the quilt top. Don't cut the quilt top. <laughs> just pull them up high and then it'll bring it up with you. Okay, so we just have a few more inches to do here. Okay, 
so I'm going to unclip my tension on the sides of the quilt. I'm going to unclip both sides. Okay. Now, I'll show you. Here is a locking device. You, uh, you want to actually have this handle attach into one of those gears. And then down at this end. A little more. Okay, right here. You want to pull the um, roller bar forward a little and, un and release the lock. Same thing with the bottom one, but the bottom one doesn't always stay off of the gear. So now I'm going to show you a little better. It's kind of hard to get a whole picture of what's going on. But I'll grab this gear here and pull it forward. And it's going to move both rollers back on my side. So we're going to roll the quilt until we're almost at the point where there's no more stitching. Okay. Now, as we quilt the quilt, this is going to get a little different. This is going to get thicker. So we won't be able to roll it as, you know, like right now I can get up to here and my machine will have enough space, but as this gets fat, well, we're going to be quilting more down in here. Okay, so we're going to put the locks back on and we're going to tighten these up, which is just rolling them back towards myself. Alright. You don't want to get a too crazy quilt. <laughs> Too crazy tight because uh, it'll bounce and it won't quilt right. But this way, we can just put these back on. Right. And then we're gonna go down to the other. And on our way, we're gonna pick off any strings and get the scissors out of the way. You don't want to ever run over those with the. Bob and I just took off, so we don't need that right now. Okay. And we're going to put the clamp back on here. And this end. Okay, so put the clamp back on that end. And now we're going to go all the way down this edge first, and then we'll start quilting again. It helps having this um, plate on, because I can push and pull and have something to push it against and hold it. Okay, so that's as far as I can go there. And since we're doing an all over design, I can just start where I am and work my way over. get these strings pulled out here. I don't want to quilt them down and I don't want to have to find them later. So I'm going to pull all of the strings off as I go because it's much easier while it's tight and in your face. Now I noticed that because I paused a little bit um, the thread broke 
when you're using the mode here where um, it runs continuously if you don't move continuously even if it's slowly it will break so Okay, so now we're going to do this square here. And I made a big mistake. Because I uh, didn't bring the bobbin thread up. So I'm actually going to cut it off here. And go back where I started. And bring that bobbin thread up. There. Now I've I'm going to have to search for it on the busy back. Because <laughs> finding a white thread on this really busy black and white print will be a real problem. <laughs> okay, so here we go. Actually, large bobbins. The more you um, the quilting you do, the more bobbins you'll use. I like to, you know, make sure you quilt at least every four inches. But when I do these leaves and hearts, I like to do a little swirl in it, and it takes a little extra uh, thread to do that. That's okay. It's it's what you want. It's whatever you want to do. Some people, when they charge people for doing long arm quilting, charge by the number of bobbins they use. Just because that's where your time is, mostly. So, I'm going to just... Oh, that broke. This happens sometimes, so of course it's always what I'm trying to show you. <laughs> but that's part of the frustration in the long arm quilting too. You just have to be patient and take your time because this is, you know, before the binding and the label, this is really the last step. And you took all the time to make all those blocks really pretty and straight and careful. So this is the next phase to just quilt the quilt. The long arm is absolutely wonderful for making it quicker. Um, I've already hand stitched quilts and hand quilted. It takes months sometimes to finish a quilt that way. And in my place right now, <laughs> I don't have enough space uh, to put out a whole big quilt and open it up and on a frame and all that. It's then you can roll it up and then it takes up a smaller space, but I don't have enough space to put it in the quilt rack in the first place. <laughs> so the long arm has been a way that actually keeps me quilting. I probably wouldn't uh, make quilts if I didn't have this. Okay, so a couple stitches. 
It might be down there. It doesn't want to. Let me take the bobbin out again. I'm just going to make sure the hang up isn't here in the top part of the machine. I really apologize for snipping. It's just <laughs> very bad allergies. I'm going to take the bobbin out. Seems to be moving freely. But I'll take it out and put it back in. Sometimes that's all you have to do. Something just gets hung up and you got to just take things apart and put them back in. Alright, try it again. Pull the bobbin thread up. Make a couple stitches. down and I'm gonna go back and snip all those threads close to the top but not clipping the top. Right, I'm gonna finish this part and work my way up and then sew back down. Sure, my needle's down and I'm gonna quilt the rest of the quilt. You got the idea, and then we'll get back together. Alrighty, so we finished quilting the quilt together, and now we're gonna take it out of the rollers. So I'm gonna take the clips off, and I'm also going to bring this down here so it has a little more light on it. Okay, so I'm going to cut uh, the back off. Now what I probably should just do in this case is, since the top is overflowing a little bit, I can just take all the pins out and I'll trim that when I put the binding on. Okay, so I'm just going to go down the hole edge of the quilt and take the leader off. Normally there's enough um, bottom of the quilt left that you can cut it off and there will still be some extra. This one I called a little close. <laughs> um, but you should have some extra usually at the bottom and then you cut it and then it gives you a nice edge between the top and the bottom of the quilt and it makes a nice straight edge for binding it. It's probably better if you pull the pins out as you go uh, against the points so that you don't aren't pulling them back against the point and getting stuck. <laughs> There we have it. This is our, our quilt. So now we have to just cut the edges off and then we'll go up and put a binding on it. So the first thing I do is I'll take this uh, and undo these latches that have been keeping it rolled up tight. And then this is the most fun part. Unrolling it and watching how much of the how the how beautiful the quilt looks. So we're gonna pull it off the roller. And you've got this nice thick quilted blanket. I'm gonna pull it completely off. And sometimes before I completely get it off, I start trimming this side piece. Because it's easier to work with on these nice long rollers then up on the table where I have no room to cut. So 
so when you're working in small places you just uh, have to find the best way to be able to work at it easier and while I've got the weight of the blanket on the rollers it's definitely easier to manage this I have better scissors, but I don't know what I did with them. <laughs> These are working. They're just not as sharp as those gold-handled kind or the clover ones. And if you want, uh, we'll just take a nice, good look at how beautiful this quilt is getting. It's uh, all the variety of the pieces, and then doing the double nine patch really gave it a nice uh, patchwork look. So, down here, and I'm gonna work a little bit more on cutting the edges down here. I'll work a little on one end and then a little on the other end. That way it doesn't end up making a lot of weight in one place. Found the good scissors. I'm gonna go faster. Oh yeah. It's always nice to have scissors. Scissors that work good. <laughs> you just want to be really careful not to get the quilt. Um, part under these scissors accidentally because then you cut your quilt up. So I always try to hold it up a little bit so nothing is folded under it. Okay. A lot of times I'll have enough of these side pieces that I can use them for binding on the same quilt, but in this case. I don't have really enough. <laughs> so this will get worked into patches in the next patchwork quilt. Never waste a single inch of material. Okay, so right here we're gonna finish the getting it off here. Cutting this last bit. warm quilt with the flannel back. And a couple strings. Might as well trim everything you can when you see it now because it's a little harder to see it when it's just kind of in little folds on your lap up in the sewing room. Okay, so here we don't want to cut the leader, but we can cut the side piece off. And normally I don't throw away any of the um, little pieces of batting because I can use those to stuff in the puzzle balls we're going to show you how to make in a little while. That'll be one of a couple of videos where we're going to make the Ginny Buyer puzzle balls. Those are fun. And we're going to need all the stuffing we can get for that one. Okay. Now, I put the uh, gear back in. So now when I pull on this part of the quilt, now I got the bottom heavy part over the bar, over the rollers, 
I'm just going to even it out. Because we're going to cut it off the back. So, I hope I don't get in your way here too much, but we're just going to cut it off at the edge of the top of the quilt. And then the back of the quilt will remain just a little bit here. We have just like an inch or so. Now that material there would normally be good enough to throw out, but we weave rag rugs, so this little bit here will be great for making part of the weft for the rag rugs. So I really don't throw hardly any material out. <laughs> We start like by making the quilt and then what's left I use for little patches and what's left after that we put in a rag rug. So usually when I'm making quilts I have only a handful of threads and small pieces to throw away. Later on, when I'm doing washing stuff, I'll unpin that piece on the bottom, not from the bottom of the quilt, but here we have it. This is our, our quilt already. All we have to do now is put a binding on the edges and put a label on it. And then we'll be ready to give it as a wedding gift. So, the next time I see it, we'll be up at the machine and putting the binding on. Okay, so now when it comes to the binding of the quilt, I usually try to make it match something in the quilt. Sometimes you can't because they're just so busy. Um, sometimes I put like a plain black binding on just because it sort of gives the eye a place to rest. Um, but and it sort of frames it off. On this quilt though, um, I don't have any more <laughs> plain black and so what I thought I'd take is this green. I have a bunch of uh, patches in them quilt that are made with the green and of all the pieces of material that I have left from the quilt those are the biggest pieces so usually I have this little system where I need about two and a half inches but on the there's a lot of weight to the quilt and you don't want your needle of your sewing machine having to take the whole weight of the quilt so just keep it bunched up in your lap time. This is the actual finishing of the quilt so you really want it to be nice. You don't want to have any bumps or thick pieces. It's like putting a frame on a picture. Picture frame. Every now and then you might want to just lift up the binding that you're putting on and make sure you caught the back because if you didn't catch the back then that was not the point <laughs> the point is to catch the back it's good to catch the back and the front but you absolutely have to catch the back because that's the finishing part of the back I'm not a maniac about being a perfectionist all the time but you do have to make a couple things happen right and putting the binding on is pretty important. Plus, this is going to be where the most wear and tear goes on the machine on the quilt when it's getting washed or when it's getting used because it gets rubbed a lot on the edges. So you want the edges to be sturdy, strong, straight, and you don't want them to fall apart in washing or wearing. Oh, 
the really right thing to do I guess would be to trim this before you get started but once again I have very small place to work and so if I have to work six inches or 12 inches at a time then that's what I have to do and it works you know it's not the best for time but it does work One time when I was watching a quilt show a couple years ago, I really don't remember what show it was on or the name of the person. And that's sad because it would be good to give it to you. But um, there was a lady who um, went on the truck driving with her husband. And in the back of the truck cab, she had a perfect hot little setup for making quilts. And talk about working in small spaces. She did it. And it was amazing the kinds of huge quilts she turned out and how nice they were <laughs> and then she could always be with her husband the whole time so that was really great they they didn't have any kids anymore at home so that worked out good for them so you know when I think that I'd have a small space to work in well she had a lot smaller space <laughs> Looks like the quilt's pretty much up to the edge on this part. And we're almost down to the next corner. If I don't want this little edge here when I'm on the front, I'll trim it off. But right now I'm just gonna stitch it. be easier for me to see it on the front side so that's why I'm going to do it like that okay so now we're coming up to one of the seams on our binding I'm just going to fold it over we don't want to open it up we just want to fold it over Okay, so it's a little bit big here, but I'm just eyeballing where it comes to the corner of the top, and we're going to go to within a quarter inch. Needle down. Turn it. So once again, we're going to bring this up to the edge. And so down to the next corner. Just going to make sure there's, it's sewn to the back. strings on the front the edge is already finished so we aren't worrying about how to tuck it in or anything it's already folded over and it'll it won't open up 
So I'm just going to go down here about two inches. And we'll get rid of this binding piece for something else. Alright, and if you have a chance, um, this is just a tad like narrower than the outside and that's good because then you'll be able to roll it and it won't involve tucking too much of the overlap in okay so we're going to just keep it on the inside there a little bit but we are going to wind up in this same row the same ditch where the stitches were made to put the binding in so it stays straight going to take a look at the binding I mean at the yeah at the bobbin and now the bobbin doesn't have much thread on I don't want to end up in the middle of putting the binding on and have to put a new bobbin in because that just makes like another joint kind of uh, with um, another place where thread could break so I tried to always use a new bobbin on the Binding when I do the top stitching. Okay. All right. So I'm gonna flip the quilt over right about here where the joint would be. I like to sew over that part first and get it done so I don't have to come across it later on. Okay. This is a place you might like to pin or clip. I still don't do it, but um, sometimes I clip where the, the joint would be. So I'm going to fold it down. It's going to be a two-time roll, so I'm going to fold it down to where the edge of the quilt is, and then I'm going to do it once more and roll it up. And what I'm trying to do here is where these stitches are and threads and all that kind of stuff from where we quilted, put it fast to the um, uh, the batting and stuff on the quilting machine. We just want to cover all of those stitches up. There's rows and rows of it. And if I can keep that from showing on the outside of the quilt, I'm a happy camper. <laughs> So I'm just going to clip that one there, and I'll do one above and one below. So now the aim of the game here, as you uh, put the rest of the binding on, is to cover that line up of stitching, and to keep this about even. So you don't have to like measure and everything, you're just going to eyeball um, turning it under, covering up those stitches and trying to keep it at a nice even width. That's why I do the top last because I top stitch really close to the very edge then I'm sure all of the binding is in and the back usually ends up pretty close and even too but what people see all the time is the top so I really want to get the, the top nice and straight. Okay, so. Let's try it. Give it a whirl. And just slow down when we get to the clips and make sure you get your needle in the edge of every piece of that material. You don't want any of it wobbling out. If it does, go back and get on it again. Okay, you don't have to rip those stitches out that go off, but you have to be sure that you get this sewn down. It's absolutely the most critical part here. Sometimes you can do something fancy like a zigzag stitch or one of um, the stitches that the machine does, like a blanket stitch. Those look really nice. And, um, you know, that's the kind of where you can add a different color thread and give it a little extra 
bling, I guess, okay? So there's lots of things you can do with your bindings. Uh, this particular quilt's so busy already, I'm not going to add anything else. But if it was more plain, I would probably add some kind of cool stitch. Okay, so you see what's happening here? We've got very nice, uh, neat stitching along the edge of the binding. I don't know if you can see. <laughs> so it looks really good there. And when we turn it over, most of the stitching is on the edge of the binding. But sometimes when you're doing it, it'll go off onto the back. And that's actually fine. It's It can't be perfect although I guess you could be perfect but I'm never perfect so I'm really happy when it hits the edge of the binding but we're not this the purpose of that stitch back here is not to hold it down because we already did that stitch when we went around the back the purpose of it on the front is to hold it down so this is where it's really crucial that it's in a straight line holding every piece of that binding down if you miss it, it's going to open up sooner or later in its lifetime. So try really hard to get it. You know, and that's why maybe if you're not a real good top stitcher, and you know if you are or not, just zigzag it. Um, make it a big zigzag or a little zigzag, but it, it won't be as noticeable. And this, actually, this stitch won't be that noticeable either. Because once you wash it, it pulls together, it squishes in, and makes it look more quilty. Uh, so you know it'll still be nice and if you give it to somebody because you made it with love it won't matter <laughs> There's a the green patch and it matches the, the binding, so it kind of ties it together. I like that. I used to go through a lot of trouble to buy binding and make it match. And I think the best way I can match it is by using some of the materials in the quilt. Keep pulling the threads out. I don't want to have anything sticking out now. This is the finishing part. At this point, I'm going to start the needle down positions. Now, we've got a corner here. This is going to come over it. And so we've got this corner of uh, quilt that we really don't want to mess around with. It'll just make the corner bulky, so we trim it off. And we trim it so that there's still, you know, some stitching there, so it's not going to pull apart. Okay. So now we've got a corner brought up. Now we're going to just fold this down like we were all along. And in this side, the one that's going to go down on, you fold that up and push it up this way till you get that angle. And then you fold it back this way. Now make sure all of the edges are under. And so what we're going to do is stitch down here Put the needle in here, turn it, and then go down this way. You don't really ever have to sew this part because if these two are nice and tight, that's not going to ever undo. And it makes a nice mitered corner in your quilt. Okay. I'm going to turn it. I'm going to catch 
reach every edge. And look at that. One happy little corner. <laughs> now we just have to make that happen three more times. Okay. So that's beautiful. That's not going to come out ever. And it finishes it off in a nice miter, which always looks good. Fold it in half, fold it up on the bottom part, bring it up here to the corner, make the miter, and away we go. The needle stays down. Now we've got four corners that look alike. They were intimidating, but you managed to make them just because it was not that hard. And as we come up on the last few inches of this binding, just remember what a big project this seemed like in the beginning, but only one piece at a time and you've managed to complete a quilt. Don't look at the big monster project, just look at one piece at a time and you'll get it. Now we want to try to make this stitching come right into this other. And cut it and we're all done. The binding is completely done. We're going to trim that a little bit. Okay, now we're going to make a label for the back. So I'm going to go get the label. Um, there will be a time when I do a couple classes on making the quilt labels from scratch, but um, fabric.com and most um, quilting websites or quilting stores have like a half a yard or three quarters of a yard of just quilt labels and you pick out the one you like, write on it, and then you sew it down. So I'm going to show you how to do that next. I'll be right back. Okay, before I do the label with you, I told you I'd tell you about this stylus. So uh, I have this stylus. Um, it comes apart and then you can put the end in there. And then you can use this to push your fabric through, you know, the the presser foot without getting your finger caught in there. You guys be careful you don't get that cut in, <laughs> caught in there though. Um, but it has been helpful especially when I'm sewing small things, especially like putting binding on pot holders. So they have these all over the place. Just kind of Google them. I think I got this one at home so but if I figure out where I did get it from I'll give you a link below. Okay now these are some uh, quilt labels I bought a while ago. When you get a half a yard of um, fabric that has all quilt labels, you think you'll never use them all. <laughs> but believe it or not, I'm finally like uh, getting to the end of mine. So sometimes I make my own. And we will have a couple classes on making your own labels. 
but I'm just going to use this pre-printed one. Now this is um, a full sheet label from Staples. You can get them by the box. And I use them a couple times, um, but I usually like, roll back the paper. And then I want to put this on here because it's very hard to write on fabric that's not stuck to something. Okay, if you tried to write on this, it wouldn't look very nice. But by putting it on this sticky paper back, um, it gives you almost like a writing on paper feel. Now, I'm allergic to latex, so I can't use just any sticker. Okay, and these uh, label sheets are acrylic based glue, and that's the only reason I can even touch this. <laughs> So before, if you're allergic to latex, you got to ask, you know, the manufacturer um, what kind of adhesive they use. And if it's acrylic, you're good. Now, I use a couple different kinds of pens, but I found this one to actually be the best. It's um, a Marvi Uchida, U-C-H-I-D-A, fabric marker. It's permanent, so you don't want to get any of it on your clothing. Um, but I've had other markers wash out on me, and so far, these don't wash out. So, we don't want it to wash out. We want this to last 100 years. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to put on here to Heather and Vince. Congratulations. And then under the from, uh, you can write just your first name, but the best thing on a quilt label is to give your name and location so that 100 years from now, when this quilt ends up, uh, you know, thousands of miles from here, um, it'll be neat for people to have some kind of history about it. So I'm going to just put my name on there. And I'm going to put my city. and my state. And then the last thing you want on there is the year. And I always write something on my quilt labels to them. Um, and I usually write sweet dreams because I want people to have sweet dreams when they're sleeping under my quilt. And it's kind of crammed on there, but that's okay. I will make a heart. Okay, most of the labels when I make them myself, um, like from paper piecing, I make a little bit bigger label and then I can write something else like um, a poem or just a little bit more of a sentiment. So this is still sticky and it's still good, so don't throw it out. Reuse it a couple times. Okay, now I'm going to position it on my quilt corner. I always like to do them in the corner. Um, I fold under the corner first and then the sides down. That makes the miter just like we did on the quilt uh, binding. And I'm going to stick a pin in there. In this case uh, clips just seem to be too big and bulky for me because this is pretty fine tiny corners. So I will make my corners first. Stick a pin in. And I'll make my fourth one and then I'll go around the edges and fold them in. You really don't want these edges coming out and fraying because this is what you want this to always be with the quilt. Now I'm going to tell you some stories about <laughs> things I've heard. Um, sometimes a quilt might get a hole in it or something. Uh, and one lady that I read about, when she sews this quilt uh, label down, underneath in the middle of the quilt, she'll stuff a few uh, pieces of fabric that she used in the quilt. <laughs> and she will have to tell somebody about that that she gives the quilt to. But if the quilt ever gets like, uh, needs a, a small repair, they can 
uh, remove the quilt label and underneath the label will be some of the fabric and what's really cool about that is um, the material that's underneath the quilt label has been washed just as many times as the quilt so if somebody takes that off to put on uh, to use the fabrics to repair the quilt they won't be like looking fresh and brand new they'll be worn just the same as the quilt top and I just thought that was a cool idea I've never done it but I thought it was a cool idea just the same okay so I have it on there pretty straight and now I'm gonna take those pins that I just put on and quickly kinda take it out and pin it right to the quilt back it can go all the way through um, but when you put the label on you are only going to sew it to the back you don't want your stitches to go through to the front okay so just make sure all the edges go under so you can't really sew these on by machine because the machine would sew from front to back and then you'd have a rectangle or whatever shape your label is. Okay, so now that's on there very good. And I'm going to take a piece of dark thread because we don't want to use white on the dark green. I'm just going to use a piece of black. I'm going to turn my little light on here. It'll help me see. It might help you see. Now, if you're using polyester, you only need one strand. If you're using cotton, and it's a good cotton, it doesn't break like when you pull it, you can use one strand. But if it looks like it's going to break, just use two strands. Mostly we don't ever use two strands in hand sewing, but to keep the label on for lots of washings, you might need to. Alright, so just use your judgment. See how strong your thread is. I'm half blind here, so I'm going to use a needle threader. Sometimes threading the needle threader is a challenge, right? Yeah. Need to be a little more open. There we go. Yay. Okay, so you make a knot by rolling the thread. Try to show you. You take the little tail and you roll it under this other piece and you pull it down. Sometimes it takes a couple times. <laughs> there you go. Wind up with a knot. Okay, now I'm gonna start on the bottom corner just because it's a way I'm not gonna get stuck with all these pins. And I'm gonna pull it under there and get the knot in. Now the knot shouldn't come through, so if it does, make another bigger knot. That one's good. Now I got a little tail here, so I'm going to tuck that under. And I'm just going to attach it, you know, in about every eighth of an inch. I'm going to stick down in and then up into the next piece into the label. Let me see if I can get that a little better for you. Try to hold it. <laughs> All right. I'm gonna pull it tight, but you don't want it to pucker. Now I'm at the corner, so I'm gonna come up in the corner, and that's a little hard there. But I'm going to put a couple stitches in that corner because the corners will get more wear, more tugging. So I put about three stitches in there. Let's see what's the 
best way to show you. Okay, so I'm going to take out the next pin. I'm going to catch it under about where this thread comes up and then do an angle. So I'm going to take it about where it is and then an angle. And the closer to the edge you are, the less stitching will show. Whatever you do, just keep it consistent. If it shows, it's okay. You just want it to look even and the same. Take your time. Enjoy the process. This is the last part. Okay, so now there's some pins here, but I'm going to fold them under so they won't stick me and I can get a better hold as I go up to the next corner. You don't want to be able to get anything under these stitches. My grandmother used to say when you quilt, don't make the stitches too big to catch a toenail on. <laughs> I thought that was kind of a funny way to put it, but actually she's right. It's the, the best way to think about it. You don't want to be able to get anything caught under your stitches. So I'll keep them a little small. I'll get to the corner. I'm going to put like three stitches in there. And pull those pretty tight. I want those coming out. You don't want to break your thread though. Okay, so now we're on the top. So we're just going to go straight across there. It gets a little easier to hold when you don't have pins that are going to stab you. And then when they get harder to reach, I just roll it under. Sometimes you can do two stitches and pull it. I don't usually ever do more than two though. Okay, I'm going to take that out of there. Be careful when we get to the corner that none of the corner cloth comes out. Got to make sure we get it all stitched under so it doesn't fray three or four stitches in the corner. Then I'm going to turn it so it's easier for me to get at. And it goes a little faster as you get less pins to work around. I'm going to be showing a lot more videos on different kinds of sewing techniques and a lot of different quilts that I like to make that I'm hoping you will like to make too. Um, so I hope that you like and subscribe on my videos and come back often. I'm hoping for once a week but I'm just getting started so it's taken me a little while to <laughs> get all the techniques down and all the video editing I like doing but it takes a while to get to learn the software. So once I get better at it we should be having more more frequent videos but please check back because I've got a lot of things in store for you and lots of different crafts and you'll enjoy them all okay I'm getting down there on the corner so I'm gonna get in there I'm gonna turn it a little bit so you can see it And um, my YouTube channel is going to have more than quilting. It'll have lots of other things, quilting and sewing, but there will be, um, we're going to paint dragon eyes, we're going to do acrylic painting on rocks, and 
Um, we got weaving. We're going to be doing rugs and ink loom straps, and it'll just be a really great variety. And maybe there'll be some new craft they show you that you'll like to do too. So I would like to hear from you though if you'd like to leave comments for me. Um, I'd like to hear the books you like to listen to or read. And I'm going to tie a knot here, but I'm making like two stitches. And each time I'm putting my thread in the loop and that makes a knot, then I'm going to put my needle in and bring it up in the middle of the label somewhere and cut it off. And that keeps me from having a, a thread loose and it doesn't work the knot so much. Um, if the knot gets rubbed, it might open. So I make three knots and then I pull it in here and then the, the thread there will disappear and it won't get pulled on. So we have finished our quilt. I'm going to try to show it to you opened up on a bed. And then uh, I hope you go try it for yourself.